Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the latest episode of If Data Could Talk. I'm your host, Andy Cotgreave, technical evangelist at Tableau and co-author of The Big Book of Dashboards. This week, I'm joined again by Amanda McCulloch, who is Senior Data Visualization Lead at Excella and Operations Director at Data Visualization Society. And this week, we're also joined by Sarah Wachter, who is the Product Manager of Augmented Analytics at Tableau Software. So welcome to you both. Amanda, welcome back. Uh, what topic are you going to talk about this week? I'm going to dig into the different ways that we're disaggregating some of the COVID-19 data and exploring different things like risk and about who is actually social distancing. Right. Looking forward to that. And Sarah, welcome to the show. Uh, what, what will you be covering? Thanks so much, so much for having me, Andy. Um, I will be talking about the use of business intelligence, forecasting, and uh, whether or not to use it with COVID data. With a small spoiler, don't. Don't. <laughs> or be very, very, very careful. Okay, so with that, let's get started. I get the pleasure of doing the first segment once again. And this week, I wanted to share how the New York Times has been, again, excelling at data storytelling. So I want to share, share a story about social distancing and highlight some of the great things they did. So first, let's share my screen. I want to focus on this, an article from the New York Times, looking at whether people have started staying at home since the lockdowns began across the US. It's a great story from the New York Times, and there are two great aspects and one little gotcha that I wanted to talk about. First of all, they use this really smart satellite photography technique to make the change feel really real and relatable. So what happened in Seattle, pre-lockdown, people were on average in Seattle moving around 3.8 miles, which is the size of this square. And after the lockdown, it's this tiny square. So post-March 26, the average distance in Seattle was just 61 feet, the size of a fairly comfortable sized house. I mean, very visceral sensation there. Uh, and then in Daytona Beach around Florida, uh, daily travel is the big box. Again, pretty big. But what you can see is uh, even up till the end of March, uh, travel size hadn't really reduced. People were still uh, covering very big distances. Uh, so it's just a small thing what they did here. But I think that satellite imagery is, is, is something we try to do as storytellers, try to make the data feel relatable and relatable, uh, feel real and relatable. But the thing I want to spend a little bit more time looking at is the map which really caught my eye. So it shows when did people reduce their daily travel distance to less than two miles. So as you're all looking at this, what is it that's popping out? What's the first thing you notice uh, when you see this chart? If you're south. like me, oh, sorry? The south. <laughs> the southeast, that's absolutely right, Amanda. It's the red, look at that. In the southeast, each county is, or many counties are still red which means that by March the 26th, the average person in that county had not yet reduced their daily travel distance to under two miles. Now, the New York Times does acknowledge that many of these counties uh, have sparsely distributed populations, so they have to drive a long way just to get to the store or doctors or hospitals, but so do many of the other counties across the US. So whatever's happening here is probably social, political, or cultural. Uh, and you know, just as a simple technique, I think that's really powerful. Uh, using color to pop out and highlight the thing you want to talk about is something we can take away from this story. But my next thought was then, well, what about my personal experience? Uh, we like to find ourselves represented in data we look at. And I spent a lot of time in Washington State at the headquarters of, of uh, Tableau uh, in Seattle. So my eye was then drawn up to Washington State. Hmm. And now we have something of a problem with color palette choice. So by now, my eyes are up in the top left of this chart, a long way from the legend. And I'm looking at four different colors, which represent four different date thresholds when people stop moving. But when my eye is in this part of the screen, I'm like, you know what? I have no idea which one is which. Uh, and in fact, Amanda, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Uh, <laughs> each one of these color tones represents one of these dates, 16th. March 19th, 24th, or 26th. Can you tell me which one represents the 16th? My gut, Andy, is that if we're going over to red being the dark color for the latest date, the 16th is the lightest color, which would be one. Uh huh. Then two is the 19th. Uh huh. Three is the 24th. 
Uh huh. Four is the twenty sixth, but All part right. of that doesn't make logical sense to me, given where uh -huh. Seattle is. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, uh, do you count yourself as a data visualization expert, Amanda? I mean, people call me that sometimes. <laughs> I, I think I'm, I think I do okay. <laughs> I think you do pretty well. All right. So, guess what? I set you up to fail, or I didn't set you up to fail, but you did get that wrong. Uh, the darkest green is the earliest date, and then it goes light green, light orange, dark orange. What's happening is the New York Times are trying to do a rainbow palette, but I think they've gone down the wrong path. Now, the good news, Amanda, is I've asked 80 people on Twitter and colleagues how many people did correctly get the palette right. Well, only 39%, so only 28%. Uh, people actually got it wrong, right? Most people got it wrong. So you're not alone, Amanda. But what's the uh, what's the point here? I'm trying to show that um, when our eyes are a long way from the legend, we can't pass this data, right? So let me show you. This is what actually happens when you build a map like this and the legend's far away. I'm looking for Seattle. I'm, I try and register a color. I go down to the legend. I look across. I look back again by which time I've forgotten the color I was looking at in Washington state. So I go back up, look at the light orange again, then forget again. So I come down to the legend and it's just, it's a massive cognitive load for a reader to try and pass this rainbow color palette. So the New York times do exceptional work. They're under a lot of pressure to get things right. If I'd have done this again, I might just say, go from that to a color ramp, uh, a continuous color ramp, one that contrasts with red then it might have been a little bit easier for us all to understand the colors when our eyes are a long way across the part, a long way from the legend. So there you go. That's the two simple uh, storytelling techniques that I enjoyed in the New York Times this week. The satellite photography was one. Uh, a great use of uh, pop out red to highlight a story. And the rainbow color palette, probably one we best not stick to too often. Uh, and that's, that's what I've got for you this week. So uh, Amanda, do you have any comments uh, on that before I go over? You tricked me. I, though it may, I mean, it makes some logical sense when you think about it now that I'm thinking about it more. I think the Unicast dashboard was not dissimilar. I think they used a darker green. The darkest green was the A's scores for social distancing. Yeah. Um, whereas the, the oranges, as they got darker orange, veered into the lower, the lower grade ranges. So maybe yeah. there was inspiration taken from that dashboard. That's all I can think of. Yeah, I think, I mean, you know, we, we know in Sarah knows we, color choice is so uh, important, easy and difficult and challenging. So uh, thanks for your comments there, Amanda. Now let's move on to you. So the New York Times is beginning the, the wave of stories we've uh, been reading about, about social distancing. Um, we know we have to do it. Can people follow it? Um, how rigorous does it have to be uh, and i think amanda you've got uh, some interesting stuff you've been seeing about social distancing in the media too yeah let's take a look at another example from the new york times this seemed to be a really popular uh session to go ahead and focus on and a data set to focus on over the course of the last week so i want to focus on another article that the new york times wrote about location data and talk specifically about some of the more nuanced information in the location data that's not just about location and county level geography but instead thinking about who is able to do social distancing and so in this location data breakout they instead of focusing just on the locations themselves focus on who was doing the social distancing so as you see this great example of scrolly telling it breaks out the social distancing efforts of different metropolitan areas, with the y-axis here being the change in movement. And as you see this break out further, you see them disaggregate this data such that instead of just looking at all of these squiggly lines, you're eventually broken down to looking at highest income and poorer areas separately. And here, I think they've done a really nice job of going ahead and making something that's both a really interactive kind of scrolly telling approach to unpacking a complex data set but also combining different kinds of charts together. And I'm increasingly seeing some really great innovations in how people are presenting information and calling out different data stories. Here we have the two different lines that tell us the story of the average change in movement. So the top of that y-axis, the 50% more movement than usual, down to 100% less movement at the bottom. And you can see that there was a three-day gap 
here in between when the highest income locations had cut their movement by half compared to poorer areas. And I think this is where we have to start thinking more about the various reasons why people may not be able to follow different social distancing recommendations. People who are still considered essential, rural areas where you have a high percentage of people who work in healthcare or in manufacturing and are still being asked to go to their jobs. People who have to just drive farther and maybe we're only making one trip to the store a day uh, or, or a week actually, sorry. So as I look at this, it really calls attention to me about the ways in which we have to look beyond just the maps and looking at the maps at a county level and look at what social distancing looks like between different demographic groups and have a greater understanding for who has the privilege of being able to do social distancing. And for me, this also calls attention to things we need to think about now as we look at the US context and what we've done and we see this disease start to spread in other countries that have very different environments, have densely populated markets, have less resilient health systems, um, different countries where I used to work um, over in Sub-Saharan Africa where I worry a lot more about the, the feasibility of social distancing efforts to curb the and stop the spread of COVID-19. So I'd be curious, Andy or Sarah, any thoughts about this kind of breakout of data and drilling down a little bit more beyond the geographic information? I, I, that whole, the aspect of disaggregation, I think is, is fascinating. I think we've got quite a lot more to say on that. It might be a future episode. Is that right? <laughs> I think we probably could dig into this a lot more. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, what... It, just showing this, one of the, it just, you know, I fell in, I, I, I love working for Tableau because one of the reasons I fell in love with the product 12 years ago is you could literally explode your data and disaggregate your data and disaggregate it just with a drag and drop. And it just, it really enables that uh, zoom in, zoom out, zoom in, zoom out, and which is so powerful here. Uh, also, what you, what you said there reminded me of Hans Rosling, you know, his original mm. Gapminder talks on TED and his Gapminder implementation also allowed you to allowed you to plot a continent then explode to a country and then even down into county level again you know he was emphasizing that many many years ago and it still seems a step beyond a lot of uh, analysis we see out, out there so it's it's great seeing this piece of work yeah, I mean, I think of that that Ronsling video a lot, and I think I still show it in some of my data visualization trainings of that, that yeah. health and wealth correlation. So I want to dig in a little bit more beyond this data on social distancing and pivot us a bit back to some of the case-related information. I think one of the reasons we've pivoted away from some of the focus on case data is because of the recognized uncertainty and gaps in that information. So let's zoom back to a really fun, beautiful report. You can see the elegant visualizations of, of text information up here at the top, clear takeaways stated. But I want to focus on some nuances from last week's morbidity and mortality weekly report. These are the technical reports put out by the CDC on a about weekly basis. Um, and this data was summarized into a series of charts in an NPR feature all about the ways different groups are being disproportionately affected by COVID-19 and the different kinds of outcomes we're seeing among people who have different pre-existing conditions or illnesses who may be more likely to need intensive care treatment. And as you see in this summary from the article, there are some conclusions about the fact that we there, there is a likelihood that you will need um, more serious treatment if you have one of these underlying conditions. This isn't incorrect or wrong, but I think we need to pay attention to and think about what this chart is trying to tell us. First, it might be helpful to maybe think about the fact that you're really comparing these different disease conditions and the cases who have this, these diseases against no pre-existing conditions at the bottom. So if we start to break out a little bit of a color differential and a dotted line there, you can see just that big difference with each bar representing the share of cases with known information for people who had that given disease, so say chronic renal disease, who also required ICU treatment. So here, 56 of 202 cases. And they do a great job of being very specific on what numbers are represented here. But back down here in the bottom, we see that this summarizes 6,637 cases. And given that this is from the end of last week, if you've been paying attention to some of the numbers, you know that that's probably a pretty small subset of the total cases that we have. So while this is useful information, and I think is really important for us to start to dig into and understand, one of the biggest stories I still see in the COVID-19 case data is the information we don't have, the information that is unknown. So if we go back to that beautifully formatted CDC technical report, I know you're on the edge of your seats right now. I am, I am. 
you can see that in their table, look at this, they actually went ahead and called out at the very top of their table in bold text, the number of different cases that actually had full case reports. And this is out of around 122,000 total cases at this point in the US. And what share of those were missing or unknown for all conditions? 67,000, right? Wow. And let's go back and remember that this is for 6,637 cases with information. This is important information for us to understand. It's great data for our epidemiologists to dig into and to better understand how we treat and who's more likely to be severely impacted by this disease. But one of the biggest things we have to keep paying attention to is the gaps we have in our data and how generalizable some of these different findings are. And Andy, I think we might have a throwback here to our chart chat where we were talking about this with a different MMWR, all yep. about kind of age-related breakouts. And there they'd actually plotted a bar chart of some of the data, which drew people's eye in. And here I want to applaud and think that maybe they made this decision purposefully to call attention to that uncertainty in the data. I, I, it's really interesting that I, I, I shared a tweet from the, about an article in The Guardian this week uh, where the, the article itself was talking about how data models adapt and improve all the time because that's how data models work, particularly when studying a brand new disease we don't have data for. And yet the headline was why data models get it wrong. And it's like, that's so unhelpful because it's like, well, yeah, of course they get it wrong. We don't know what this disease is doing. We don't have the data, right? You know, even, even the best data sets are massively incomplete. So, oh, it, it, yeah, my blood boiled a little bit. As, as I, I guess that's the copy editors uh, who are just trying to make the clickbait headline. I read it and then got cross and tweeted it. Um, yeah. <laughs> So I fell for that trap. But yeah, I, I, the, the uncertainty is just, it, it's great to see it uh, coming up uh, to, the, to, the, to the top of the table. That's fantastic. It is. And I think that uncertainty really speaks to the fact that it's really hard and difficult to do really good, accurate forecasting, especially drilling down into different levels of the population and different groups. And we just don't have that information. It's really hard to build meaningful models, that kind of garbage in, garbage out philosophy, where our models are our own best guesses. Yeah, indeed. Yep. Which let's, let's segue. That, yes, thanks that for leaving sounds, that up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, forecasting. So I mean, we have the incomplete data, but we all want to know when do we come out of lockdown? When does the curve get flattened? When might we return to some sort of normality? Right. So we want to know what's going to happen. Um, and you know, lots of people watching this, we're all data analysts, and we have access to business intelligence tools. With one click, we can turn on forecasting models and I can plug the data in and see what's going to happen, right? Wrong. So uh, Sarah, you and I uh, worked on a blog post that I published this week describing maybe some of the things we should think about when actually considering forecasting. So let's uh, move on to that. So Sarah, say hello. Just let us know a little bit about your, uh, about your job at Tableau. Sure. Yeah. Uh, my name is Sarah. I'm a product manager with the Augmented Analytics team based here in Boston. So I'm working with the team on enhancing our abilities within Tableau to provide good analytics, just give people more access to tools that help them with prediction. Fantastic. Uh, well, thanks for joining us this week. So tell us um, a little bit about forecasting how it's generally implemented across business intelligence platforms you know when when is that forecasting a good thing to be doing sure so forecasting is a tremendously useful tool lots of bi platforms have some form of it incorporated in the, in the product include tableau and generally speaking it's great for situations where you have complete data so calling back to what amanda just said we don't but situations where you've got complete data you've got data that extends over a long period of time and usually with data that's got some kind of consistent time series uh, information in, in included in it um, and so kind of the canonical example here is something like sales forecasting where you know all of the sales that you've made you can certainly aggregate it by store or region or state um, you know that there's going to be kind of an underlying trend to it that you know yeah we're increasing 10% a year 5% a year what have you um, and you know that there's some kind of 
elements of seasonality, right? If you're a retail store, you generally know that your sales are going to be greatest in Q4, in the lead up to Christmas when people are going through that Black Friday period of shopping. Um, or if you're in real estate, you know that the summer months are probably going to when you be when you see the most sales in your area. So mm -hmm. there's these this consistency over time and these trends over time that are just sort of very easy to pick out. So I, I th my next question was going to be, so why might this not be a good idea to use on COVID-19 data? And I think you just said complete data, known seasonality, uh, and oh, there was another one, right? But uh, do you want to elaborate on why they might be tempting to turn that forecast on? Uh, maybe, maybe it's not a good maybe idea. Maybe let's not, yeah. Yeah, so it, we have very incomplete data with respect to the COVID situation. This is a completely new disease. We are still learning things about how it spreads, who it spreads to, who's most susceptible to having severe effects uh, in terms of the health conditions, whether they'll need hospitalization or ICU treatments. Um, the data is just woefully incomplete. We don't know enough about how it behaves in the population. We don't know whether, like the flu, it's going to be more calm in the summer and more active in the winter. We don't know any of that sort of information yet. And so it's just a situation where we just don't know. I mean, we know some things, but we don't know mm. hardly anything in order to yeah. build the kind of model that would have the kind of accuracy you need. And without all of that information and without all of that context, what anytime you see a prediction that's coming from the sort of out of the box forecasting tool, you need to be thinking about the kind of error bars that you're getting on it, that this is a prediction that might be in the middle of a range that's two or three or 10 X what that prediction is. Yeah. And so it, it's, it's basically meaningless without that additional knowledge. Yeah, fantastic. And I mean, if you want to find out more about uh, Tableau's forecasting model, it's called a Halt Winter's Smoothing Model, which I discovered in the creation of the blog post we wrote. Uh, we actually have loads of documentation on that uh, on, that you can go and find. And, and, you know, it's a standard model. You can find information out about that. Um, so, OK, so if, if ticker box forecasting isn't good, but, you know, I, I guess a question that I'll come to both of you with is, but I'm a great data analyst, apparently. I mean, you know, I've been doing this job for nearly for a job similar to this for 15 years. I know statistics kind of, and I know the scripting engine in Tableau. And can I not just take the uh, data set of COVID-19 cases and deaths and then build a predictive model using my, st my statistical knowledge? It seems like if Tableau's forecasting isn't good enough, you know, I know a bit enough to get some sort of line. Is that not a, a good option for me either? Yeah, so, so Andy, I'm actually going to turn that question right back at you and ask you a couple of questions about what you know about COVID uh -oh. data. Oh, yeah. So here, <laughs> oh, about COVID, not about statistics and data analysis. I mean, you, you can expose some holes there if you want as well. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I mean, how many, what, what percentage of symptomatic patients are being tested for COVID right now? I don't know. Yeah, okay. How many were being tested a month ago? I don't know. Yeah. How many asymptomatic patients are being tested? I don't know. Do you not know that one either? Yeah. Okay. No. <laughs> uh, how, how about this? I'll, I'll stop asking you about, uh, about the, the raw data and I'm going to start asking you about some of the situational stuff around it. So when did New York City shut down the public schools? Uh, I could find that out. You could find that out. Yeah. When Italy shut down public transit, what effect did that have on the transmission rate? I don't know. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm, I, I could keep going. I'll, I'll give you uh, some mercy here, but um, you. you know, ob obviously, there's just so much that you, even with your years of experience in statistical analysis, you don't have the information, and nobody, unless you're working as an epidemiologist, is going to have that information, and even those, those epidemiologists, even if they don't have it at hand, they still have the training, the expertise, the knowledge, um, just the raw experience of working with these kinds of incomplete data sets that they can build better models and they can interpret them more accurately. And you need both of those components. Yeah. So unless you have that experience, you know, you're really just kind of sticking your finger in the wind and, and hoping that you come across something. And I think it's really 
you know, from an ethical perspective, I think it's really doing a disservice to your readers, your, your listeners, your watchers, um, to be putting these things out there without having that internal domain knowledge and that confidence that what you're putting out into the world is real, is true, and is helpful. Um, and so I think those are really important tests to be asking yeah. yourself, you know, are these, am I actually benefiting the world? Am I saving lives by putting this information out there? Yeah. And I think, you know, we all have to have some humility about our boundaries and the, the limits of our knowledge in terms of, hey, I don't have the background to make these decisions. If people were making decisions based on this information, um, there's a potential to do really serious harm and in fact cost people their lives. Yeah, I, um, I, I, I'm going to pick up on that last point. I, I was going to say that, that, thanks Sarah, that's fantastic. And Amanda, do you have anything else to add to that about do you have any more questions for me to reveal that I don't know the answers for? Or? I, I just <laughs> or, I have so much respect and appreciation for Sarah right now for yeah. coming back and, and saving me for being not the only one getting something wrong today. <laughs> uh, so I think one of the, the key things here is, that I've seen is that uh, there's a difference in some ways, even for epidemiologists, between creating models that let you go ahead and, and use a lot of detailed subject matter expertise to, to estimate what might happen, and then plotting those models in interactive data visualization formats and ways, charts, graphs, interactive tools that someone can play with. Like the IHME model pops to mind that now is getting shared as a static picture at large press briefings by policymakers. And so when we start to plot the results of our models, which is what tools like Tableau do so well, we assign a certain degree of certainty to them, which I think makes the process of producing that model and sharing it even more dangerous if you don't have all of that context in terms of being able to produce something that is meaningful and can meaningfully inform policy and the choices that people are making, either on a high level and a policy level, or at an individual level that are causing me to say, yes, today I'm going to continue to do social distancing and stay at home. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the, only, the, the only thing I'd add there is, you know, we, we've, we've used the word epidemiologist, but it's also virologists and all the other categories of people who are qualified to talk about this kind of prediction. And I am not. Uh, so, uh, so thanks I, for that. I, so I, I guess, go ahead, Sarah. Sorry. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, I, I think if you are qualified, you know you're qualified. And uh, if you don't know if you're qualified, you're really not. And I also, also wanted to build on Amanda's point a little bit that, um, you know, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. And we're in a situation where we're trying to build, you know, these epidemiologists among us are trying to build useful models, and we can expect to see those models change as more information comes to light, as we new, learn new things, uh, as the changes in terms of social distancing take place and have a chance to play out. And yeah. so it's not wrong when predictions change. That's the nature of the beast. And mm. so we just sort of have to internalize that knowledge of uncertainty and accept that this is, this is where we're at right now. Fantastic. So I guess I'll ask you both uh, the, 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 the final quick point on this. What should I do instead if I have access to some COVID-19 data? Sure. Uh, Sarah, Amanda. go ahead first. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I would say, number one, stay home, wash your hands, uh, practice good social distancing, send emails to your friends, uh, hang out with them online, not in person, uh, and figure out the best way that you can to support your local community and your local healthcare providers. I've been really involved in making hand-sewn masks for our local hospital system, which doesn't have enough protective equipment for uh, the nurses or the patients. And so that's a really great concrete way to help. But if you can't do that, um, see if you can offer to deliver groceries for your neighbors at their porch, if you have any neighbors or elderly people uh, that are in your neighborhood that might need some help. So just be kind to each other and do the best you can. Stay at home uh, and please wash your hands. Yeah, very sage advice. Amanda? So I would also add that if data is something that gives you comfort to explore and interact with and use data and try to make sense of it yourself, I know people for whom that's what's helping them kind of make sense of the world around them, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of ready available data about COVID-19. None of what we've said today means that data isn't available. It just means it's uncertain and incomplete. 
And so go ahead and download data sets analyze them, visualize them, try to make sense of them for yourself, but really think carefully about if what you're creating and doing for your own exploratory purposes needs to be published out into the public domain. Does it really serve a purpose? Does it add value or does it really just add noise? And so I would, I would say definitely consider um, using that approach if you want to. Also recognize where the data is not serving you. Yeah. If you don't need to watch the case counts every day, climb, go ahead and turn off the news and focus on those key actions that Sarah called out for us. Yeah, amazing. Well, that's that, 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 that absolutely superb recommendations. I've got one other announcement, uh, which is another thing, you know, you might want to do. Uh, this week, Tableau announced that we are giving away our, or we are offering free 90 days of e-learning uh, of the entire Tableau platform. So if you are in this in a, in a strange situation right now and have time and want to do some personal development, you can get free Tableau e-learning and you know, digging into the data that's available on our Tableau Data Hub is a great thing to do, uh, particularly if you're staying, so, you know, exploring, finding your own insights, uh, using that to develop your skills. That's one other thing you might find useful. Uh, so that just about concludes our time. Um, we have do have plenty more resources available. There is the Tableau Data Hub. We've got master visualizations, uh, curated viz galleries. You can go and see what other people are doing with COVID related data. We're seeing how uh, customers and public sector are using Tableau and doing data analysis. So go check out the data hub. Uh, we do have the free e-learning, uh, go and check that out. Um, what else can you do? Just follow us on social media, uh, click subscribe to the Tableau If Data Could Talk channel and tell us what you're thinking. Ask us questions, share things you're reading that maybe we can cover in future episodes. So that's it for today. Amanda and Sarah, thank you so much for the conversation. Uh, thank you for revealing the depth of my knowledge, but I like to be <laughs> that uh, the full guy representing the audience. Um, so thank you both very much. And to everybody watching, thanks for spending the time with us. We'll see you again next week. Goodbye.